Religious Extremism in Pakistan Finally, there are the various extremist groups in Pakistan. Like any other country, Muslims in Pakistan run the gamut from borderline atheists to hardcore fanatics. The hardcore fanatics are the ones we always hear about. But even hardcore fanatics have levels. Most are simply devout Muslims with views that do not jibe with modern sensibilities. These Muslims may support the blasphemy law and may consider non-Muslims to be unclean, but they will usually never resort to violence. And then there are the crazies. It all began with the Soviet war in Afghanistan. General Zia-ul-Haq agreed to assist the CIA in arming the Afghan Mujahideen against the Soviets. He created paramilitary training camps in Pakistan which doubled as Islamic seminary schools called madrasas. As Muslims around the world have done for centuries, young Pakistani men gravitated to these schools to study Islam. However, General Ziaul Haq's schools went a step further and encouraged these young men to join the fight against the Soviet Union. By 1989, the Soviet Union had pulled out of Afghanistan, but now its isolated and mountainous border with Pakistan was flooded with thousands of hardened, well-armed, well-trained Muslim guerrillas who knew nothing else but warfare. As Afghanistan descended into chaos after the Soviet withdrawal, the Pakistani government sought to bring some stability to the nation. Members of Pakistan's intelligence services helped create the Taliban, a band of Afghan student soldiers who fought against the Soviets. Seeking money and connections to strengthen their fragile hold on Afghanistan, the Taliban partnered with wealthy Saudi dissident Osama bin Laden. When Osama bin Laden was implicated in the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the U.S. government targeted him and his Taliban sponsors. The United States turned to the Pakistani government for help against the Taliban, and new president Pervez Musharraf agreed. Angered by this betrayal, the Taliban joined forces with other militant groups in a three-pronged war against the United States, the new Afghan government, and Pakistan. This gave rise to the militant group known as Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, or TTP. The result has been nearly two decades of violence, destruction, and death in Pakistan. In 2007, TTP militants took over Islamabad's Lal Masjid, also known as the Red Mosque. For nearly two years prior, the militants had been causing trouble in the region by destroying property, attacking women for not dressing properly, and calling for the government's overthrow. When the police tried to stop them, TTP fought them off and holed up inside the mosque. The president called in the military and a siege began. When negotiations failed, the army moved in and fought the militants from room to room. Over 100 militants and 10 soldiers were killed. In 2008, TTP infiltrated the Swat Valley in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province along Pakistan's northwest border with Afghanistan. TTP demanded the government implement their version of Sharia law. When Pakistan refused, TTP began carrying out the law on their own. As TTP atrocities mounted, the government took a few half-hearted measures, including directing the local police to handle the situation. Outgunned and outmanned, the police were forced to give up control of the valley to TTP. One of TTP's most draconian measures was the prohibition of school for girls. Even after the government and TTP worked out a temporary peace deal, girls were still forbidden from attending school in SWAT. In late 2008, the BBC's Urdu website wanted to do a profile on how girls in SWAT were dealing with the situation. A local activist named Ziauddin Yusufzai suggested his 11-year-old daughter would be a good candidate. Over the next several months, his daughter Malala, writing under a pseudonym, shared her experiences in SWAT via blog posts to the BBC website. Some of these posts made it to local newspapers raising the suspicions of TTP. 
By May 2009, the peace deal had broken down and the army was preparing for another invasion of SWAT. Meanwhile, Ziauddin and Malala were still advocating for education rights. Malala appeared on national news shows and gave interviews about the crisis in her home. As they became more vocal in their criticism of TTP, word got out that Malala was behind the BBC's blog posts. TTP began sending Malala and her father death threats. She joined local women's empowerment groups and nonprofits for the disaffected children of SWAT. In 2011, she was nominated for the International Children's Peace Prize. That same year, she won Pakistan's first national youth prize. TTP finally decided to make good on their threats. In October 2012, a TTP gunman boarded a bus the 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai was riding home from school. He demanded Malala be identified and when she was, he shot her in the head. The bullet passed through Malala's head just over her eyebrow, then down through her cheekbone and her neck before lodging in her shoulder. Two other girls were also injured in the attack. TTP's attempt to silence Malala Yousafzai backfired. The attempted murder shocked the world and brought international attention to the violence in Swat Valley. Politicians, activists, celebrities, and even Islamic scholars were united in their condemnations of TTP and support for Malala Yousafzai. Doctors were able to save her life and Malala went on to win a slew of awards including the Mother Teresa Award for Social Justice, being named one of Time's People of the Year, and finally, the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize. TTP and other militant groups continue to wreak havoc in Pakistan. To date, over 60,000 people have been killed in a fighting between the extremist militias and Pakistan's government.